In this last lecture, I'm going to introduce the double copy. This will serve as an appetizer for the lectures by Donald O'Connell at the summer school on the double copy, but I'll present a rather different perspective that hopefully will be complementary to what he does and give an, a different type of perspective. So let's talk about the double copy. We saw already in lecture two, when we studied three point amplitudes and saw that they were fixed uniquely by the helicities for massless particles up to an overall constant, that there was a relation between the kinematics of the free point graviton amplitude and the Yang Mills amplitude, namely that the free point color order Yang Mills amplitude for gluons squared was exactly equal up to an overall constant of the free point graviton amplitude. And I mentioned back then that this was a hint of the double copy. In fact, what is true, and what is true at tree level for amplitudes, and perhaps even also at loops, and I won't talk about loops here, I'll focus on the tree level, but that is that, loosely speaking, Yang Mills times Yang Mills in four dimensions gives you gravity plus an axion dilaton. Now, in D dimensions, there's also a relation between the double copy of gluon amplitudes, Yang Mills times Yang Mills, and gravity, and then it's gravity plus an antisymmetric two form plus the dilaton. Most of what I'll say here would be valid in D dimensions, but when I write specifics of amplitudes, I will do them in four dimensions using the 4D spinner helicity formalism that we discussed. So the goal of this last lecture is to introduce you to the double copy at tree level and try to explain how remarkable it is that such a thing can possibly work and then give you a little bit perspective of the underlying structure. So the type of double copy, the double copy can be found in many different forms. I'll comment toward the end of the lecture about different versions of it. And the, the particular form I'll focus on in these lectures is the so-called KLT form. KLT stands for the authors Kavai, Lavellin, and Tai, who first discovered a double copy in the mid 80s in the context of string amplitudes. In particular, they noticed that the closed string amplitudes could be written in a certain way as sums of products of open string tree amplitudes. And what we'll talk about today is, in a sense, the field theory limit of this correspondence, namely the limit where alpha prime is going to zero and we look at the leading order parts. But we'll get to back to the string case later and the connection to the alpha prime limit. For now, we'll focus on field theory and we'll do a bottom-up approach where I won't take this top-down approach from string theory, but I'll simply ask basic questions of the following form. Given what I know about the tree amplitudes in Yang Mills theory and the tree amplitudes in gravity, how can a double copy possibly even work? And what would it look like? Okay, so we're taking this bottom-up approach, we'll forget about strings and just focus on field theory. Now, the amplitudes that we're going to deal with in Yang Mills theory come with a color structure. Of course, the gluons transform in the adjoint representation of some color group, and in gravity, there's no color structure. So somehow we have to get rid of the color structure, and it turns out that one sensible way of doing so is to look at the partial amplitudes, the color-ordered amplitudes that we discussed earlier when we talked about the Park-Taylor amplitude, for example. So what you do here is that you factorize off the entire color structure. At tree level, you can always do that as a single trace of the n generators for an n particle amplitude. And because the trace is cyclic, I can fix one of the lines, say line one, and then I can permute all the other ones. And so that means that the number of such color ordered amplitudes will be n minus one factorial because that's how many permutations there exist of n minus one factor uh, of n minus one lines. Okay, so the full amplitude is a sum over n minus one factorial terms that consists of the partial amplitudes where the square brackets here denote the fact that we have a color ordering and that color ordering will be cyclic because it is uh, contracted into it. It's multiplied by a trace that has, of course, a, a cyclicity associated with it. All right, now I choose in my color orderings to keep the first line one fixed. And then for four point, I will have six different orderings because 
uh, 4 minus 1 factorial is 6. And here I'm just listing what those are. So I have color orderings 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. with all the possible permutations of lines 2, 3, and 4. How do you calculate color order and amplitudes if you were to use Feynman rules? Well, the Feynman rules will tell you to write down just the diagrams where you keep the external numbers of the lines fixed according to the order that they appear in 1, 2, 3, 4 in this case. So I always have 1, 2, 3, 4 in my ordering. And then no lines can cross. So you keep the order of the external lines fixed and no lines are allowed to cross. So for Yang Mills at four point with ordering 1, 2, 3, 4, we see that specifically I have a diagram in the 1, 2 channel that will provide, since we're dealing with massless particles as gluons, uh, this will have a pole in the S channel. Then likewise, there's a U channel pole. And finally, there's a term that is polynomial. It doesn't have any pole. It comes from the contact term in Yang Mills. So that's how it would look like in Feynman diagrams. In particular, what I want to emphasize is the pole structure. There's an S channel pole, a U channel pole, but a T channel pole would involve either that I reorder the external line or that I cross two lines and that is not allowed by the color ordering. On the other hand, if I were to switch the ordering such that now I switch the order of lines three and four, then my diagrams will now read one, two, four, three, one, two, four, three, one, two, four, three in their ordering. And now we see that unlike the other case, I have a T channel as well as the S channel, as well as polynomial possible, possibly polynomial terms. Now this stands in stark contrast with the graviton amplitude. As we talked about, gravitons don't have any color structure. And so there we have to always sum over all the diagrams. And so in particular, in the four point graviton amplitude, there's an S channel and there's a U channel and there's a T channel. And there can also be terms from the contact terms, so the polynomial terms. So that's what it looks like in Feynman diagrams. So now looking at this and thinking about taking a product of color ordered amplitudes, such as the yang mills amplitudes are displayed here, how can it possibly ever give the correct graviton amplitude? A graviton amplitude, even, even not just the whole structure, but just thinking about the pole structure, how can it possibly get the pole structure right? When a graviton amplitude has to have simple poles in the S, U, and T channels, when the partial amplitudes don't have this and even have overlapping poles, how can that possibly even work? Well, let's see how this works. First of all, the way it works is that it's not just a product of amplitude. It comes with something that we'll call a kernel. So let me show you how that works. So there's a double copy kernel. And this kernel is basically one of the central subjects of what I will tell you about. So the way I could attempt to write this is as follows. Suppose that I take my Yang Mills amplitudes with color orderings 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I multiply it with a one way interchange 4 and 3. At least that way, I will generate something that has all the right poles. So I multiply this by A4, 1, 2, 4, 3. Now this guy had an S channel and it had a U channel. And this amplitude had an S channel and a T channel. Loosely speaking, I can think of it like this. So we see that in the product, I'll certainly get a simple pole in the U channel. I'll get a simple pole in the T channel, but now I have a problem. And that is that I get a double pole in the S channel. So, why don't we just multiply by S and I'll include a minus sign here for convenience. Let's just multiply this and see whether that could possibly work. And miraculously, this actually works and it produces the correct amplitude. Not only does it have the right simple poles, as you can naively see from this multiplication, but what is non-trivial is that on each of these simple poles, the amplitude that results from this funny product 
actually factorizes correctly into three particle graviton amplitudes. This is actually producing the correct result. But that's not the only thing I could have done, of course. Another thing I could have done is to have taken the same amplitude and multiplied it by itself. So the same color ordered amplitude with orderings 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. What would I get now? Well, now I'm in the situation where I have S and U channels in both of them. But I don't have a T channel. So in the product, I'll get double poles in the S channel and the U channel. Let's try naively to compensate those by multiplying by SU. But I'm totally lacking the T channel, so let's just add that by hand. This looks like a completely made up way of writing a double copy, and it has no right in principle of working, but it does. This again gives the correct answer for the graviton amplitude. This seems very peculiar that such a naive approach that I just suggested here would actually give the right answer. So maybe I should work a little harder to convince you that indeed it does. So let's do that. So let's consider the product minus s times the color ordered amplitude 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, uh, 1, 2, 4, 3. So this is the first case up here. And I'll focus on the MHV sector. So I put minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus on these states. And then we'll write it in terms of the part Taylor amplitude. So what is S? Well, S in spin helicity is angle 1, 2 times square 1, 2. And then I'll write the first amplitude. And I just switch colors so that you can see which one it belongs to. This one is 1, 2 angle bracket to the fourth to signify this the special significance of the 1, 2 negative helicity lines. And then the cyclic product of angle brackets that are associated with this color ordering. And then let's do the same for the other amplitude with the other color ordering. Again, the special point, the special lines here are 1 and 2, so they get to sit on the top. And then I have the cyclic product, which is now 1, 2, 2, 4, because of the color ordering, 4, 3, 3, 1. So these are the Park Taylor formulas that we learned about in the previous lectures. All right, let's multiply everything together here and see what we end up with. So we see that at the top, I have eight powers of one, two angle bracket times another one, that's nine powers, but I have two more in the denominator. So all in all, I have one, two sitting there to the seventh power. Right, that's it, times square bracket, one, two, that came from here. Then what else do I have? Then I look at all the other orderings. I have two, three, angle bracket, times three, four, which I get twice. So let me interchange that one, and that's gonna cost me an overall sign, times four, 1 from here, times 3, 1 from there, times 2, 4. All right, and that's the whole thing. Now let me rewrite this. You may, rec you may or may not recognize this as the correct graviton amplitude. It actually is, but as a way of writing it that maybe is a little more suggestive of it being the right form. So I'm going to take this form here, and I'm going to multiply it by a square bracket, 1, 3 to the third power, divided by the same thing, as well as the same type of square bracket for 3, 4, but now to the fourth power. If you rewrite things this way, you can use momentum conservation, uh, for example, uh, to rewrite this entire expression, and I'll leave the details as an exercise, you can rewrite this as 1, 2 to the 4th power times 3, 4 to the 4th power, all divided by S times T times U. 
So this explicitly shows the poles in the ST and U channels, and you can explicitly see that the little group scaling for this amplitude is also correct. And indeed, the dimensionality is two. This indeed is well known to be one form in which you can write the graviton amplitude with helicities minus minus plus plus. And so indeed, this actually does work. This particular form of double curve does work, and so does the other one. But now going back to these two relations and seeing that we have two different forms of the double copy that's supposed to give the right answer. So this was star one that I used. Then if I compare star one and star two above, they're both true, which means that the left hand side must produce the same graviton amplitude and it must do so for all choices of helicities. But now if I subtract these two relations from each other, I should get zero by M4 minus M4. And then on the other hand, I get A4, one, two, three, four, because that is the common factor that both of them have. And then I get an overall minus S as a common factor also. And this then multiplies in the first relation, simply A4, one, two, four, three. And in the second factor, because I'm subtracting them from each other, I get minus u over t times a, four, one, two, three, four. So in order for this to be true, it must be that this factor, the amplitude doesn't vanish, s doesn't vanish with generic momentum, this thing must be zero. In other words, it must be that a, four, one, two, four, three, is equal to u over t times a4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Such a relation looks very non-trivial in general for color-ordered amplitudes, and it's not satisfied by any color-ordered amplitude, but it is satisfied for the Yang-Mills amplitudes. So it would not necessarily work for all amplitudes or for any amplitude. In some color ordered model, but it does hold playing mills. And this relation is an example of what is known in the literature now as a BCJ relation. B, C, and J stands, oops, here, for Bern, Carrasco, and Johansson, uh, who studied the double copy in a different form, which is known as color kinematic duality, and you'll hear more about that in the lectures by Donald O'Connell. Now, the BCJ relations that I list here is part of a set of different relations that amplitudes in Yang Mills satisfy. So recall again that at n point, there are n minus 1 factorial partial amplitudes or color ordered amplitudes for various, uh, for all these different orderings of alpha. And at particular, these are not independent. But in yang mills theory, they satisfy a set of relations, and those relations are known as the KK relation, that stands for Kleis Kjörf, as well as these PCJ relations for which we saw an example at four point. In particular, at four point, what these relations amount to are the following. The KK relation uh, consists of two different types at four point. There's a trace reversal, which says that if I reorder the trace in a reversed manner, then this is the same as one, two, three, four. 
here I've used the cyclic symmetry. This is, of course, also equal to 1, 4, 4, 1, 2, 3. And therefore, you can see how this is a clear trace of reversal. This latter thing was just the cyclic one. There are three such relations among the six amplitudes. And let me simply write them out. So you can see all the relations completely explicitly. And then there's one more, which is so-called UV decoupling. These are called trace reversal. And then there's the U1 decoupling identity also, in which you imagine that in your color group, you pick one line to be in an, an abelian factor. And then you get an identity that says that if you add up the amplitude with that line, in this case, four, put in all possible places, it should decouple. This has to add up to zero. And of course, then in addition, we had our BCJ relation that said, and I just recorded here for completeness. It gave a relation between two of the amplitudes. Now, how many relations do we have here? We have three trace reversal plus one U1 decoupling plus one PCJ relation. So this gives five relations among the four minus one factorial equals six independent, or six, six amplitudes, six color ordered or partial amplitudes. And so that means in yang mills theory at four point that there's only one. So this implies there's only one independent amplitude at four point. And by that, I mean a color ordered amplitude. So only one partial amplitude in general at end point you find that the combined KK plus BCJ relations, actually we could, we could split it in more, the KK relation reduces N minus one factorial amplitudes to N minus two factorial, and then BCJ further reduces that to N minus three factorial amplitudes. So the combined KK and BCJ relation means that there's only N minus three factorial independent amplitudes. Now that n minus phi three factorial is significant because the KLT formula for which these uh, um, these relations that I gave here are examples. These are actually KLT formulas at four point that we just naively wrote down to make sure to get the pole structure right in the four point amplitudes. They actually have a general endpoint form, and that endpoint form involves a sum over n minus three factorial amplitudes. And let me write what that looks like. So the endpoint KLT double copy formula can be written in the following form. It says that the end particle amplitude for, for gravity is equal to a sum over color orderings of which there are n minus three factorial So n minus three factorial alphas and n minus three factorial betas. And then it takes the left sector amplitude with color ordering alpha, multiplies it with a kernel, which depends on the Mandelstam variables, and then multiplies that with a right sector amplitude with color ordering beta. And again, this object here is what I'll refer to as the double copy or KLT kernel. And this is something that is a function of the Mandelstam variables. In particular, at four point, the examples that I gave before would show you that S4 with ordering one, two, three, four, one, two, four, three is simply minus S, 
Whereas if I had picked a different color ordering in the sum of alphas and betas, I have to pick n minus 3 factorial out of the n minus 1 factorial options. If I pick alpha and beta to be the same at 4 point, then we can read off from our double copy relations before that this kernel is minus s times u divided by t. So this is the KLT formula for the double copy. And in general, at n point, there's a different kernel. And the kernel will be a higher order uh, rational functions of the Mandelstam pol polynomials. So as n is a rational function of n point Mandelstam. What we have seen already at four point is that this kernel plays a very important role. It has the property that not only it, that it cancels potential double poles that would arise from the product of the left and the right yang mills amplitudes, but it also, as in this example here, supplies the missing factorization channel that you wouldn't otherwise have. In many ways, it's really a miracle that such a formula works. In gravity, you have endpoint interactions in the Lagrangian when you expand the Einstein-Hilbert action around flat space. Those endpoint interactions generate horrific Feynman rules. That means that if you naively write down what the Feynman rules are for a four-particle amplitude with gravitons, it's about four pages of LaTeX. On the other hand, a yang mills amplitude is much simpler. It's about a line in a generic setup. So you take a product of two lines and somehow the product of th that reduces, that, that is what the four pages of Feynman mass for the graviton amplitude reduces to. And all this works because there's just a nice little kernel that enters and cancels off potential double poles and supplies missing poles. This is truly a miracle that it works. And you might think that it's just a miracle that applies to the case of Young Mills, but it is in fact quite a lot more general. So what it actually does is that we could think about this not just as a double copy for Yang mills but for any kind of theory that would obey the set of relations, the KK, the combined KK and BCJ relations. So basically any model, or by which I mean any field theory, that obeys the KK plus BCJ relations can be used as the left and right amplitudes in this double copy. And then you could ask what could actually come out. Well, first of all, let us just discuss a little bit how this works. So in general, with this way of thinking about it, I can think about the double copy as something that takes a field theory in the left sector times a field theory in the right sector and maps it into the amplitudes of a field theory in some product, so loosely speaking, product of field theories. And this product here is defined by the KLT kernel. And the idea is that for the same kernel, the same set of KK and BCJ relations, I can ha have a map that is defined this way, and any field theory that obeys the KK and BCJ relations, whose, whose tree-level amplitude obeys the KK and BCJ relations, can be used as input on the left and the right, and in use to generate some new field theory. So you can see that this basically generates a web of possible double copy theories. How does it work? Well, one of the things we know is that if I think about this in 4D, then any state here I mean, so you can ask what kind of theory do I generate from this? If I have a particle of helicity HL on this side and I double copy it with a particle with helicity H right, then we know that in, in, the, in the little group scaling, what you get out of the product of amplitudes will obtain nothing from the kernel because that just depends on Mandelstam. But it must be that whatever state it maps to by little group maps to something that has helicity, which is the sum of those states. That follows simply by the fact that over here, things would have to scale uh, in a way 
that comes from these two products uh, as, as I explained. So that allows us to say, how did we actually get gravity plus action diloton? So in particular, we would have Yang Mills times Yang Mills. What are the states here? Well, I have gluons with positive helicity and I have gluons with negative helicity. If I double copy things with the same helicity, I get, on the other hand, gravitons. And I get those gravity gravitons with helicity plus one or minus, sorry, plus two or minus two. But another way I could double copy is I could mix the helicities. And that way I would generate something that has helicity zero. And those two states with helicity zeros are in a sense each other's conjugates. And so they correspond to a set of complex scalars. And this is particular, all of this is for 4D because otherwise I couldn't characterize things with simple helicities. Now, what are these complex scalars? The complex scalar has a real part and it has an imaginary part. And the real part is the diloton and the imaginary part is the axion. And that's why we could call this gravity plus. It's gravity plus the diloton plus the axion in four dimensions. More generally, if we were in D dimensions, the product of the yang mill states will produce the graviton states in D dimensions, as well as a diloton, as well as the antisymmetric two form. So we would sometimes call that an SNS gravity. Now, it is interesting that the KK and BCJ relations are also obeyed by certain other field theories. Are also obeyed by the tree amplitudes of certain other theories. And that then gives a web of field theories. And so here, let me prepared, like in a cooking show, I have pre-prepared a map uh, that shows this. So here you have a web of theories, and I have just picked a selection here. We have Yang Mills times Yang Mills, which we now know gives an S and S gravity. I can super symmetrize Yang Mills to get super Yang Mills theory, n equals one, n equals two, etc., n equals four. Here I've just shown the example of n equals four super Yang Mills. If I double copy n equals four super Yang Mills with itself, I end up adding up the amount of supersymmetry to get n equals eight supergravity. If I double copy it with Yang Mills, on the other hand, I have n equals zero plus n equals four. That gives me n equals four supergravity. And whether I do left or right is the same. So the axis left, right is symmetric in the standard double copy. There's also another very interesting theory that, that uh, whose, whose amplitudes obey the KK and BCJ relations. And that's, I've denoted as chi PT. This stands for chiral perturbation theory. And that is an example of a nonlinear sigma model with a coset group. So it's a nonlinear sigma model that describes the spontaneous breaking of UN times UN to a diagonal UN. So it lives in a, this, it has a set of scalars that live in a UN times UN mod UN coset. So that's a particular uh, example of a nonlinear sigma model and its amplitude to be the KK BCJ relations. If you double copy chi PT with itself, you end up with a theory that we met in lecture one, namely the special Galileon. That was the one that had an enhanced softness of Sigma equals three. On the other hand, there are also other things I can do. I can double copy chi PT with the Yang-Mills theory, and then I end up with Born-Enfeld theory. Born-Enfeld theory was one theory I described that is the brain of a space filling the free brain, and, in, and that has electromagnetic duality, as I alluded to in, uh, in, in lecture two. Now, I could also double copy with n equals 4 super Yang Mills. That gives an n equals 4 supersymmetric version of born infeld as you might imagine. And that is exactly the direct born infeld action, which is 
the action of a D3 brain in flat 10 dimensional space with a 4 n equals 4 supersymmetry, where the scalars of this theory parameterize the fluctuations of the brain in the transverse direction. There, for this uh, that volume in 10 dimensions, a 3 dimensional plus 3 plus 1 dimensional volume of the free brain has six transverse directions, so there's six scalars. Those are the six scalars of the n equals 4 massless supermultiplet, and they, tra they transverse those fluctuations. Those are all Goldstone modes associated with the spontaneous breaking of those six translational symmetries, just as we learned about for the Dirac, uh, uh, for the D DBI action, and this is simply the supersymmetric version thereof. So a lot of the theories that we've encountered in our lecture one suddenly show up here as results of the double copy. That is, is of course, very interesting, along with the fact that supergravity also shows up, including maximally supersymmetric gravity in four dimension, namely n equals eight supergravity, which is in itself is a very interesting theory. Now, speaking of softness, there's actually a nice interesting feature, namely that the double copy tends to enhance certain, certain symmetries. And it does so at least at the leading orders in which it double copies. So the double copy enhances softness. What do I mean by this? I mean that if I take a model on the left, which has particles with some soft behavior, sigma L, and a model on the right with some whose particles has softness, sigma right, then the softness of the particle that this maps to in the double copy will be softness of left plus softness of right plus an enhancement. And that's the enhancement that I meant, that plus one. Let me give you an example of this. In this nonlinear sigma model that's called pi bt, the Goldstone modes that comes from an internal symmetry breaking, in that case of the un times un mod un, they have a softness which is sigma equal to one. So this is vanishing soft fears with sigma equals one. So one plus one equals three. That's how you get the sigma equals three of the special Galilean in that model. What is another example? Well, here's an interesting little feature that Yang Mills theory has divergent soft theorems. So it has sigma equals minus one. Sorry, equals minus two. I should call it sigma equals minus two because we know that the amplitudes had a soft behavior that was 1 over epsilon squared. So amplitude, what does this map to in the double copy? It should map to minus 2 plus minus 2, that's minus 4 plus 1, that gives us sigma equals minus 3 for the gravitons. And so this is for gluon, this is for gluon, and this is for the graviton. That is cor exactly the correct answer that we found from the master formula in the previous lecture. Other fun features, well, in n equals 4 super young mills, there are scalars. So the scalars in this theory have no particular softness. The origin of the moduli space in n equals 4 super young mills is not a homogeneous space. So as you take soft limits, you probe the nearby vacuum, and they do not have any particular softness. So these scalars have softness 0. But what do they cobble, double copy to? They double copy to some other scalars in n equals h supergravity, and those scalars will now have an enhanced softness, which is in which is of degree one. So those are indeed some kind of Goldstone modes, and this is in fact exactly true, that in n equals eight supergravity, there are seventy scalars, and they are Goldstone modes. What are the Goldstone modes of? Well, the theory has a hidden E77 symmetry, which is, you can think of as being spontaneously broken to the SU8R symmetry. E77 has 133 generators, SU8 has 63 generators, so that leaves 70 broken generators. And those are exactly associated with the 70 scalars of the theory. Now, not all those 70 scalars arise from scalars in Yang-Mills, 
because there are only six scalars, six real scalars in n equals 4 to being Mills theory, and six times six only amounts to the 36 of those 70 scalars. So the rest arise from the double copy of gluons of opposite helicity, that give a Dilaton axion type scalar, as well as fermions, gluinos with opposite helicities. That amounts for all the 70 scalars, and we can discuss more and talk more about it if you guys are interested. So the softness is enhanced, and you could go through the entire table that I showed you here and see how the softness relation that I wrote down here, whoops, exactly holds. But there's another thing that also appears, and that is sometimes global symmetries can also be enhanced. So let me give you examples of this. Let's stick again with n equals 8 supergravity. So we learned that n equals 4 super yang mills times n equals 4 super yang mills through the double copy gives us n equals 8 supergravity. Now n equals 4 super yang mills has an unbroken SU4 R symmetry. So we are certainly guaranteed that the double copy of this model will have SU4 times SU4 R symmetry. But this magically enhances in the double copy at the leading orders to SU8 R symmetry. And it is very non-trivial that this actually happens. Of course, it has to happen for the double copy to work, but it is quite non-trivial when you look at these sums of products of amplitudes that such an enhancement takes place. Another example of this, so this is example one of this global enhancement. Example two was that we learned that Yang-Mills theory times chiral perturbation theory in the KLT double copy results in Born-Infeld theory. Now Born-Infeld theory has electromagnetic duality. And that manifests itself on the tree amplitudes as the statement that the amplitudes vanish unless the number of positive and negative helicity von Infeld photons is the same. So this is zero unless n plus equals n minus. But we know well that in Yang in Yang Mills theory, the color ordered amplitudes such as the ones with of the MHV form, they're certainly non-vanishing. So when you put this into the double copy with the scalar amplitudes of chi pt and double copy, it turns out that the MHV, for example, that any amplitude in that double copy will give you zero unless the number of positive and helicity, positive and negative helicity sector <coughs> uh, gluons is exactly the same. So double copy of, for example, um, MHV, or the Park-Taylor formula, with chi pt gives zero for any n that is greater than 4. So 4 is, of course, special because that has two positive and two negative helicity gluons, and that gives us the born infill 4-point amplitude. But at any greater than 4, it is highly non-trivial that in the sum of n minus 3 factorial terms in the double copy, these cancellations end up happening. All right. So that's, uh, that's a fun feature and an important structure that we have in these double copies, that it enhances both the softness, and in many cases, it can also enhance the global symmetries, as it must in order for these relations to actually work. Now, let me come back to this multiplication table here, because there's one more theory that I would like to tell you about. So, actually, what I will do is that I will bring down my multiplication table again, if I can.
Well, it won't let me, so let me do a copy of it. And bring it down here. Now there. And I'll shrink it because I want to make room for one more thing. There's one more theory that I would like to tell you about whose amplitudes at tree level obey the BCJ and KK relations. And once I have cleaned this up so you can better see, we can focus on the relevant parts. I will tell you what it is. And it plays an important role for what I'll discuss now. So what is the new model that I want to put in here. It is a model that's called the bi-adjoint scalar model. And I'll tell you shortly what it is. But first, I want to describe to you what it does in the double copy. So the bi-adjoint scalar model is a very simple model, and its amplitudes obey the KK and BCJ relations. When you double copy it with anything, it gives that anything back. So to double copy a bi adjoint scalar with Young Mills gives Young Mills. If you double copy it with n equals four super Young Mills, you get the n equals four super Young Mills theory back. If you double copy with the chi pt, you get chi pt back. And of course, same here in the horizontal line. And if you double copy the BIS theory with itself, you get itself back. So now we have a new entrance. And if we think of this table of the double copy as a multiplication table on the space of field theories defined by the double copy kernel, we see something very interesting, namely that the BAS model is like the identity of this operation. So it's like the identity operator, so to speak, or the identity element. Basically, BAS is equal to BAS times BAS. BA, uh, and if I multiply BAS with any left copy, I give that left sector amplitudes back. And likewise, a right sector times BAS multiplies to a right sector. A different way of writing this would be to say that there's an identity element that I'll call one, which stands for the BAS model. And one has to be equal to one times one under the KLT product. Left is equal to one times, sorry, I, I obviously mixed up left and right here. Thanks for yelling at me, ha ha ha. So I should have said right and right, and this is left times one. Okay, and this object here is something, this structure is what we'll call the KLT algebra. That there's a certain algebra that has an identity element. And this identity element is a key feature in what I'm going to, to talk more about here in the double copy. Before I do that, let me tell you more about what the BAS model is. So it says by adjoint scalar. That means that it's a, it has a scalar field, which has two adjoint indices. And those adjoint indices belong to two different flavor groups that are called G right and G left. And one index belongs, the unslashed one belongs with the right. And the dotted one, the second one, belongs with what I'll call the left. So you could think of these color groups, for example, as being a UN times another UN, and the Ns don't have to be the same as long as they're not abelian. What is the action for this, or the Lagrangian for this model? Well, there's a kinetic term, which is whatever you could imagine that it should be. It's something who has the indices appropriately contracted. And then it has a very simple cubic interaction term, which I'll write as 1 over 3 factorial g. 
and then the non-abelian structure constants associated with the two groups. So this is the one for G right, this is the one for G left. Whatever non-abelian structure constants they have, times a product of three adjoint fields. This is a type of interaction that we're not so familiar with when we have a single scalar field in the adjoint, a scale field in a single adjoint, because then the asymmetric contraction with the fully antisymmetric structure constant would simply vanish. So we need the two non two antisymmetric structure constants in order to get something non-vanishing here, and we do. Because there are two color structures, there's a color ordering of the amplitudes, and by the way, this is the entire action, this is it. The color ordering is double in that there's a color ordering for these for the three amplitudes there's a color ordering that's associated with the right sector and a color order that's associated with the left sector now you notice here that i have right group on the left and left group on the right that is not a typo that is intentional and you'll see why shortly so there's double color ordering with respect to each case. And so let me give examples of what these color ordered amplitudes are. At three, part, at three point, I could have a color ordering which would be the same. And that simply just gives me G from the cubic interaction. But I could also have flipped the ordering in the second part. That's gonna cost me a sign because of the antisymmetric nature of the interaction. So that's going to give me minus G. When you look at the color ordered amplitudes, you have to include only diagrams that are compatible with both of the orderings. So if I pick the orderings to be the same, it's just like calculating color ordered amplitudes that we have seen before. So I have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four and there are no contact terms, there's no four particle interactions, so this simply gives g squared divided by s plus g squared divided by u. On the other hand, if I were to flip the color ordering of the second factor, then what would I have? So I flip these two orderings, then the diagram that I had first, one, two, three, four, is compatible with both color orderings, but the U-channel diagram is not. And because in the second diagram here, for the cubic vertex, I will have flipped three and four in the second ordering, that will cost me a minus sign. So this amplitude is minus G squared over S. I apologize for any background noise during this recording. Hopefully you can still hear. So these are examples of the color ordered amplitudes, and of course, as you go to higher point, it gets a little more complicated, but it's, but it's still very easy to write down the amplitudes systematically. So this is what the biadjoint scalar theory is. But what does it mean when it participates in the double copy, that it has a double copy structure, and what does it mean to have that biadjoint scalar double copies to itself? So what does one equals one times one mean that the BAS double copies to itself with itself. What it means is the following. Suppose we take our double copy formula. So it's some sum over color orderings alpha and beta of which the n minus three factorial of each as we've learned. And now I take my double copy amplitude that I want to double copy. It has some color orderings left and right, which I'll get back to shortly. I have my kernel, which I know has to have a color ordering alpha and beta, which is what I'm summing over. And then it has the other sector on the, on the right sector amplitudes. So the way this should work is basically like you would do multi matrix multiplication, yet you pick a left index alpha, that is what you're summing over here, and the right sector beta, which is what we're summing over there. But then, of course, the MN amplitude still has a remaining left, uh, right sector index here, a color ordering, as well as uh, a left sector um, color ordering gamma. And now you see why I had the ordering that I called 
up here that the first index denoted a right sector and the second ordering denoted the left sector. That's why I had that flip, because that is how they naturally contract in the double copy formula. So what does this give? Well, something has to match the color structure on the other side, and this naturally inherits the delta and the gamma from that. And so this is exactly the meaning of one equals one times one that the amplitudes double copy to themselves. Now, that means that the M's that appear here, we could think of as a matrix multiplication of matrices. We know that the MNs that appear here, there are N minus three factorial different labels of each one of them. So let's think of MN as a choice of a three minus N, uh, N minus three factorial time N minus three factorial matrix. There's a choice that is made here of which n minus 3 factorial out of the n minus 1 factorial you pick. But I'll leave that choice implicit. And then the kernel is obviously likewise an n minus 3 times n minus 3, n minus 3 factorial times n minus 3 factorial matrix. So that means I can write the above identity in a very compact form using matrix multiplication as the mn matrix equal to the mn matrix times sn matrix times mn matrix. But now it's very suggestive to multiply. So this is equivalent to saying that one is equal to one times one. But now, of course, it's very suggestive to multiply from the left and the right by the mn inverse. And if I do so, then I'll find that the MNs on the left and the right that multiply the SN cancel, and I'm left with the statement that the kernel matrix is equal to simply the inverse of, a, of an N minus three factorial by N minus three factorial matrix. Of course, at this point, you might say, oh, wait a minute, does such an inverse really exist? In other words, if I pick any n minus 3 factorial by n minus 3 factorial matrix of my adjoint scalar amplitude, is it invertible? And the answer is that yes, it is. It has full rank n minus 3 factorial, and you can invert it, and so this actually holds. So we're learning a very interesting feature, which is that there's, as you might expect, a very clean and unique link between the identity element of a multiplication rule and the kernel of that multiplication rule. That's not surprising, because you could imagine that you have a multiplication rule which has some identity element. If you change the multiplication rule, you might also have to change the identity element. And that's exactly what this says, is if I change the identity element, I would also have to change the multiplication rule for it to continue to be the identity element. Now let's try to write this out a little more explicitly, because this was rather abstract. So let's go to four point where n minus three factorial is of course just equal to one. Then this invertible relation would say that if I pick one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four element, that should be nothing but the inverse of that corresponding matrix element, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Well, what was that one? I computed that up here, it was g squared divided by s plus g squared divided by u. So let's write this. So this is g squared divided by s plus g squared divided by u, and I have to take the inverse. Let's put everything together. I get a 1 over g squared, and then I get s times u plus u, well, u plus s divided by s plus u, and this has to be inversed. And you can see that this is exactly the same as 1 over g squared s times u divided by t. And indeed, when I set g equal to 1, you will recognize this exactly as the kernel that I introduced by the simple argument that the s and the u channel that were doubled in the double copy had to cancel, and it had to provide the missing channel s. Likewise, if I looked at the kernel 1, 2, for three in the second argument, this would have to be one over m n, and I have to be careful with the ordering of 
my elements here. So this is actually one, two, four, three, one, two, three, four. And that is the same as G squared with a minus over S inverse, because that was the amplitude that we computed right here. And once I get that, I see that this is 1 over g squared times s, and that is exactly the kernel we had when we multiplied the ordering of the left amplitude, 1, 2, 3, 4, with the right amplitude, 1, 2, 4, 3. We doubled the s channel, so that had to be cancelled by that s factor, but we still had the t and the u channel, so we didn't have to supply any extra. So this actually works, and you now see that there's a g that appears with just the coupling from the biadjoint scalar model. So now this illustrates to us that the meaning of 1 times 1 equals 1 is actually extremely important because it links the KLT kernel to a very simple field theory, which is the identity element under that multiplication rule. And, and that gives a unique link between the kernel and the three amplitudes of that model. So we might actually revisit the identities R equals 1 times r, and of course the equivalent one from the left. So what does this mean? This means that whatever the right sector amplitudes that I have, with some color ordering, should be the result of doing the double copy with the biadjoint scalar amplitudes. Now you see that the color ordering that appears here is the one that's inherited from the biadjoint right sector. The left sector actively participates in the double copy. And now I'm double copying this with my right sector amplitude. Again, I could understand this in matrix multiplication. So now let me pick this guy. I will make this an n minus 3 factorial component vector. Think of that as a vector of amplitudes in the right sector theory that is multiplied by mn times the kernel matrix times another set of vectors of these components. If I pick, if I pick the n minus 3 factorial elements, delta and alpha, to be in the same sector as alpha, so to, if I pick delta to be in the same sector as alpha and beta, the same n minus 3 factorial set, then this relation would be trivial because this Sn is simply the inverse of Mn. But this is non-trivial whenever delta, this choice of color ordering, is not in the set of the alpha and beta n minus 3 factorials uh, orderings. And it is non-trivial in a very particular way that I will now illustrate. So, for example, it is non-trivial if I do the following. So I look at my right sector with color ordering 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, sorry, 1, 2, 4, 3. Then, reading off from my relation above, this should be M4, 1, 2, 4, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll, I'll pick alpha to be 1, 2, 3, 4. That tells me that I have to divide by Sn here. So, so, so this is multiplied by Sn, which is the inverse of an M4. And this in turn has to be multiplied by a right sector amplitude with that color ordering 1, 2, 3, 4. So what is everything involved in this relation? This amplitude is nothing but minus G squared over S. But this one we just encountered, this particular matrix element is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And we know that this one is minus 1 over g squared, s divided by t u. Sorry, opposite way. This is s u divided by t. And so when I multiply this together, you see that the s cancels and the g cancel, the minuses cancel, and we get u times t divided by AR, 1, 2, 3, 4. And what we have recovered this way, this is exactly the BCJ relation 
that I originally told you about in our bottom-up approach to the double copy. So this relation here that says that the color ordering 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 3 is related to that of 1, 2, 3, 4 is exactly that BCJ relation that we encountered before. And so the lesson that comes out of this is that the meaning of right equals right equals 1 times right and left equals left times 1. These identities encode left and right sector KK and BCJ relations. And so now everything starts to fit together. The conditions that the condition that you have a sensible double copy that one times one equals one, that fits together with linking the biadjoint scalar amplitude to the double copy kernel. And once you have that, then you see that the amplitudes on the left and the right sector that you want to double copy, they have to multiply the identity element to give back themselves. And that's exactly the KK and PCJ relations. So this gives a foundational algebraic way of getting the double copy. Great. Okay. So now we see that we can do something quite interesting. And that is we can start thinking about what are really the properties that are involved here. So first of all, I want to emphasize one thing that is, that is non-trivial about this setup. And that is the following. I want to look again at the identity 1 times 1 equals 1. Now we know that the kernel is an inverse of M's, uh, but, but then does that make it a trivial relation to have this, or is it not trivial? Well, instead of writing out things explicitly in terms of amplitudes, we know we have to satisfy this. Let's write it in terms of the color ordered matrix elements. So I know now that this encodes that MN is MN matrix times an N inverse matrix MN. But the key here is that I have to make a choice of which N minus three factorial amplitudes I pick. And in each one of these, I get to make a choice. And if I make a choice so that the MN on the left and the right here are not then the same basis, so to speak, as the inverse, then this trivial, this looks like a non-trivial relation. So let me write it out as an example of this at four point. So let me pick color orderings as follow, as follows. So I pick on here on the left side of the identity, I just pick one, two, three, four. On the other hand, I'll pick the left, this part here, I'll pick to be one, two, three, four. That has to match with this guy. Actually, I'll, I'll say later what matches. So let me just write it first and I'll, I'll highlight in different colors, which indices match. Now I'm going to flip the color ordering. Here, I'll write it first and then I'll say how everything matches up. Okay, so what am I matching here? I'm matching that this color ordering must be the same as that color ordering. This color ordering must be the same as that color ordering. And then I have that this color ordering matches the color ordering in the kernel. And there's a flip of the ordering to match left with right. So this one matches this one. Of course, these are identical at this point, but this is the way the matching works. So what does this identity say? Well, this identity is exactly the same as saying that a determinant of a certain two by two matrix vanishes. So this is equivalent to saying that the determinant of the two by two matrix with entrances one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, M4, one, two, three, four, one, two, four, three, M4, one, two, four, three, one, two, three, four, 
um, 4, 1, 2, 4, 3, 1, 2, 4, 3, that this determinant vanishes, as you can see, by explicitly calculating these are exactly the same conditions. So this was just one example of choosing color orderings, but more generally, you can show that the statement that 1 times 1 equals 1, using that Sn is the inverse of the biadjoint tree amplitudes, this is completely equivalent to saying that the n minus 3 times so n minus 1 times n minus 1 factorial of all color orderings of mn amplitudes has rank n minus 3 factorial. And that is rather special. Because n minus 3 factorial is, of course, exactly the number that appears in the sum in the KLT relation. And that is, in fact, closely related. So now we have this structure that we know that the kernel is connected to the biadjoint amplitude, uh, amplitudes. And we know that, that the condition that it is the identity imposes certain conditions on the matrix. And those are, of course, obeyed by the amplitudes of the biadjoint scalar. Now, then you might ask the following questions, which is, are there, are there other choices of amplitudes mn alpha beta such that the rank of stated above is n minus 3 factorial. Such that the rank, sorry, this was not a complete sentence, such that the rank of the n minus 1 factorial times n minus 1 factorial matrix is n minus 3 factorial. That's the question. Because if there is, then we could use that to generalize the kernel. And the answer is that there is a more general choice that gives this. And let me state what it is at four point. If I take the following funny object, which I'll suggestively give an alpha prime notation. It has the same type of structure as what we just saw, but it has tangents replacing the symbol 1 over s. And 1 over u. And then if I compute here, I look at the other color ordering that we have discussed. I flip three and four in the second argument. Then this is one minus one over sine of pi alpha prime s. This will then also give you that the six by six matrix of such objects that you can find by redoing the color orderings of these is one. And in general, at end point, the similar type of structure has n minus 3 factorial rank. And these were first discovered by Misera in a paper from a few years ago. I'll, I'll put it in the references for the lectures. And these, very, these amplitudes have the right rank to provide a sensible double copy. And then if you compute the kernel that would arise from this double copy, which you get as the inverse of these amplitudes, you get nothing but the string theory KLT kernel that was originally discovered by KLT in the mid 80s. And those kernels have the structure that they give the closed string tree amplitudes as the double copy A 
of open string amplitudes on the left and the right. And that, of course, is the original strings KLT relation that I alluded to early on in these lectures. And what we've seen before is that the alpha prime theory limit of this gives the field theory KLT relations that we've discussed that gives Yang Mills times Yang Mills equals gravity at, at just a field theory statement. Now, in this context, then, we can see that the identity 1 times 1, this identity continues to hold because it was equivalent to the statement of the matrix of Mn alpha prime matrices having rank n minus 3 factorial. You can see this at 4 point for these ones by a simple trigonometric identity. But what does meaning then of left being equal to left times 1, which now has the KLT alpha prime kernel, and right being equal to 1 times right? These relations are known as the open string three-amplitude monotromy relations. And they are generalizations of the KK and BGJ relations. Now this whole structure that is obeyed both by the strings kernel and its alpha prime going to zero limit is very suggestive of a way that you might want to generalize the kernel. So we can ask if there are other solutions that give sensible KLT type double copies. And this whole structure that I have shown you gives a very suggestive picture to this. Because when we go back, so, so the answer here is, is that, that yes, there are. And, and we have suggestively uh, found some of these ones. Let me go back and, and just look at these structures that I wrote here. You might be surprised that I call these amplitudes, because after all, they don't look like things that have sensible poles. They have infinitely many poles, and they look very peculiar as amplitudes. But in the alpha prime expansion, the m n alpha prime alpha betas are indeed amplitudes of a model which is the biadjoint scalar model plus alpha prime corrections. And those alpha prime corrections are the same as higher derivative operators that are added to the action. In particular, they take the form of schematically operators of the form d squared phi to the 4. Again, these are by adjoint scalars, so the indices are contracted in certain ways with color structures. Then you could imagine there would be other structures. There's a d to the 6, phi to the 4 that comes at the next order, and so on. But this may look a little bit peculiar. It looks in particular very special. You might ask, why not a phi to the 4 term? Or why not a d to the 4, phi to the 4 term? And it turns out that only certain color structures and coefficients are allowed in the alpha prime expansion. But generically, if you were doing an EFT expansion, you would have much more general operators. And so one can indeed find a more general model of bi adjoint scalar plus higher derivative operators that give rise to an n minus 3 factorial rank matrix of mn amplitudes and therefore give a well-defined 
double copy. Double copy kernel. In such a way that you get a generalized form of KK plus BCJ relation that allows you to examine double copies such as Yang Mills plus higher derivative operators multiplied by this generalized KLT kernel with say Yang Mills plus higher derivative correction to give something which is the most generic form of gravity or an S and S gravity plus higher derivative corrections, where now these higher derivative corrections are not necessarily the alpha prime corrections dictated by the open string, but something that can have general Wilson coefficients as allowed by the generalized KK and BCJ relations that answers from these procedures. And this is something that we have explored in very recent work with a postdoc on Hank Chi, my former student Callum Jones, my just graduated student Sruti Paranchipi, uh, current student Aiden Herdeske and, and myself uh, in a very recent paper. So you can read more about it there. If you're interested, I'll put it in the references. Now, what I've tried to show you here is both that the double copy is a bit of a miracle, that the double copy kernel plays a key role for canceling potential double calls in the po poles in the product of color ordered amplitudes, as well as supplying missing poles. And it has certain properties that enhance the softness and symmetry so that the double copy can actually work. It is really truly remarkable that such a relation exists. And you can imagine that once you start messing around with the kernel, that you would introduce spurious poles, you wouldn't cancel the poles that you're supposed to. But the KLT algebraic structure that we have examined here, and I have shown you, that gives a roadmap for how to generalize the double copy kernel, and that's what we did in this paper. So let me provide some perspective on the double copy. The first level of perspective is to just think about the type of theories that are involved in the, the web of double copies that we've discussed. So I have Yang Mills theory. This is a nice renormalizable theory. And it is, of course, hugely important for nature where it appears uh, from gluons, and you have gluon scatterings happening all the time at the LHC, is essential for our understanding of nature. And that's what it describes very well, this strong force uh, in nature. Now, then we have chi -PT. chi -PT is a low energy effective field theory that describes the gold that describes pions as goldstone modes. So this is a very good way of describing low energy pions. Well, another input amplitude, uh, another input theory that we have used in this context has been n equals four, super Yang Mills. Super n equals four super Yang Mills is not just renormalizable; it's actually a conformal theory at the origin of moduli space. So this is a conformal field theory. Its beta function vanishes at all orders. It's completely remarkable, and of course, this is a theory that is widely studied. It's a it's a conformal field theory that has a very close connection to quantum gravity in the background of ADS5 times S5. It's, it's just a truly hugely explored theory with many remarkable properties. But that enters into the double copy too. Then we have the biadjoint scalar model, which plays such a key role for defining a double copy kernel. But in itself, as a quantum field theory, it's completely sick. Its potential is unbounded from below. So this is just like in your standard first lessons in quantum field theory, where you may be studying phi cube theory, and it's all, all fine at tree level, where we just have this uh, uh, expansion around, you know, small fluctuation around the saddle point of this, this weird potential, but it's unbounded from below and doesn't really make much sense as a full quantum field theory. But certainly at tree level, we can, we can just compute the amplitudes, and those amplitudes apparently play an absolutely central role for the kernel of this remarkable double copy. This seems very weird, but that is nonetheless the case. Now, in the double copy of these different theories that are used as input, we produce some very interesting theories too. 
One of them is gravity. Gravity is famously non-renormalizable theory, but as an EFT, it is of course a fantastic theory that is truly important for our understanding of nature, for planetary systems, for our satellite systems, and for your daily use of your GPS system. General relativity is a remarkable and amazing theory, but it is produced by the double copy of a renormalizable theory like Yang Mills. That's kind of weird, but it's true. Then there is, of course, supergravity, which has the supersymmetric elements of gravity, and that has been widely studied, and it enters, of course, as a low-energy limit, and low-energy EFT you can think of, of string theory, if, if you wish. So, And it's, of course, very interesting in its own right, too, plays key roles for understanding ADS-CFT correspondence, and so on. But this here, at least supergravity, ungauged supergravity, appears as in, in, in the double copy. Well, what else do we have? We have the special Galilean appearing. The special Galilean is not a good, has, is, is, is a fine as an effective field theory. It's an EFT, but it's one that belongs to what you'd call the swampland. The swamp land meaning that it's not something that in itself has a good UV completion. It would only have so with a leading DBI correction sitting as le leading DBI term sitting in front of it. Um, this is a different story, but it basically is a swampland theory, which means it doesn't have a good UV completion on its own. This is in deep contrast, for example, with something like N equals four super being Mills or uh, Young Mills theory, which is of course asymptotic with three. So one of the things that is fascinating about the double copy is that it involves so many different theories. And here I should, of course, also mention born infield and DBI and N equals 4 DBI, which are models on deep brain uh, effective theories. So these are deep brain low energy effective field theories. And so these are a widely different web of theories uh, in particular, DBI and, and BI are UV complete because the UV completion, of course, comes from um, the full string theory. So again, it's a absolutely remarkable that these things are linked together by the double copy, and it's a very different way of slicing the landscape of quantum field theories. I want to offer a little more perspective also on the double copy itself. Here, I focused on the double copy in the KLT form. That's what we talked about in this entire lecture. But there are also other versions of this. There's a so-called CHY form of the double copy, and that relies on the idea of scattering equations. That's a beautiful story. Then there's the BCJ form, which is another beautiful story that involves color kinematic duality. And this is the one that allows you to, at least conjecturally, to go from the tree-level double copy to also do something at the level of loop integrands, and that's widely used in calculating loop amplitudes. Now, the idea that we have a double copy at tree-level should be linked to the idea that the tree-level amplitude captures the classical physics of the model, and the classical physics of the model is, of course, encoded in the classical equations of motion. So this has led people to study double copy at the level of classical equations of motion and how you may generate solution in, a, say, a gravitational context from solutions to equations of motion in a yang mills context. And then finally, there's a whole interesting story about the geometric origin of the double copy from things like positive geometry that you may also hear more about in the lectures in this summer school. There are so many different contexts that amplitudes appear. There's positive geometry, there's phenomenology, there's applications in the context of gravitational waves and effective potentials for in-spirals. There are amplitudes in cosmology and correlation functions. There are amplitude methods applied in many, many different ways. And I've given you here a little bit of a flavor of what is there, but there's so much room for many more things. I've talked about scalar models with vanishing soft theorems and the landscape of effective uh, exceptional theories. 
We talk about vanishing soft theorems uh, in that context and for Goldstone modes. Then I've introduced to you the 40 massless spin helicity formalism, but that also exists in other dimensions, and it also exists in particular with 40 with masses, which is in fact linked to higher dimensional spin helicity formalisms. We talked about divergence soft theorems and IR divergences, and this is very uh, this is deeply related to some current ideas uh, regarding uh, the celestial amplitude program. And then finally here, we talk about the double copy, which has this wide set of applications, which vary from the level of fundamental interest to computations of high loop amplitudes in, for example, supergravity theories, and more recently, also its application to the in-spiral problem and its relevance for gravitational wave physics. So I hope that this has given you a little bit of a flavor of basics of amplitudes, current applications, and some exciting things. And what I look forward to is seeing all your contributions in the future. So I look forward to meeting you in the discussion section and talking more with you.